Question 21. Which of the following is the least likely associated with the imposition of capital restrictions? So two of these will be associated with capital restrictions and one will not. So A, to maintain fixed exchange rates, this will not be an answer since it is associated with uh, capital restrictions. Adjusting the flow of capital from, um, from one country or another is going to have some effect on the exchange rates. So if we want to maintain fixed exchange rates, you'll probably have to restrict capital in some way. B, the prohibition of foreign investments in certain domestic countries. Um, this is basically the definition of capital restrictions. You're not allowing foreign, foreign investors to come in and um, invest in your country. So we can go ahead and cross that off as well. And then C, providing domestic capital to foreign investors to invest in the domestic country. This would be our correct answer. This is essentially the opposite of capital um, restrictions, um, since that's normally going to be imposed on foreign investors. Answer C. Question 22. In the long run, firms operating in a perfectly competitive industry will most likely A. Set prices just above marginal cost to control competition. Uh, we can go ahead and rule this out right away. In a perfectly competitive environment, um, we are firms are price takers, not price setters, so they won't be able to set prices um, above anything other than what the market tells them. Um, so this is going to be incorrect. B, use product differentiation and innovation to gain market share. Again, we can rule this out because this is not going to be a characteristic of a perfectly competitive industry. Um, in a perfect competition, firms are selling identical products, um, so there's not the ability to differentiate or innovate to gain market share. Think of commodities as an example, like corn or copper. Um, no matter what the firm does to produce it, at the end of the day, it's corn or copper. It's a commodity, and um, there's not really much product differentiation or innovation you can do there. And then C, operate at the minimum average cost on their long-run average cost curves. This is correct. Their competitors and basic... Or, in a, perfectly com in a perfectly competitive industry, competitors will come in and drive the um, cost down to that um, and essentially take away any economic profit. So we'll go with C. Question 23. An exchange rate between two South American currencies has increased to 1.62. If the base currency has appreciated by 10% against the price currency, the initial exchange rate between the two currencies was closest to. So base rate appreciating means that the rate increased. So we started at a lower rate, which it looks like these are all lower, and then we increased to 1.62. So let's pull in um, how we're going to figure this out from a math standpoint. So I'm going to say the original rate is x, and then we have x times 1.1, to get our new rate. So um, our new rate is going to be 1.62. So we plug that in, we get 1.62 equals 1.1 times x. Divide both sides by 1.1 and we get x equals 1.4727. Answer C. Question 24. An analyst calculates the arithmetic mean for a portfolio allocated 30% to US equities and 70% to US bonds. So arithmetic mean means we're just going to be adding up those return streams and then dividing by the number of observations. He has collected annual return data for the years 2000 to 2004. Exhibit 1, stock and bond return data 2000-2004. So we're going to be 30% in equities and 70% in bonds. So essentially what we need to do is just find the arithmetic mean for stocks and find the arithmetic mean for bonds, which is going to be these numbers added up, um, and then divide that by five, since we have one, two, three, four, five observations. And then we'll weight them for the 30% and the 70%. So let me pull this in. We can see what that looks like. So we're going to have 30% in stocks, and then to calculate their arithmetic mean, so we'll have 7.4 minus 5.6 plus 3.7 plus 9.3 plus 14.7, so you can see all those return streams there. 
and then we're dividing by five for that arithmetic mean. So the arithmetic mean is contained within these parentheses here. And then to get the weighted average amount, we multiply that by the 30% allocation. So we get 1.77. Apply that same method to bonds and we get 4.634. Add these two numbers together for our final return number and we get 6.404. Answer A. Question 25. Mark Sinatra is a U.S. equity investor with a global investment portfolio. Sinatra's portfolio currently comprises North and European equities. Um, he would like to expand his portfolio and allocate $0.5 million to Japanese equities. Uh, information concerning current and expected one-month spot rates is summarized in the exhibit below. So the expected change in USD JPY rate in one month is closest to... So we've got USD Euro and JPY Euro here, and we've got the spot rates for both of those and expected spot rate in one month. So essentially we need to um, use these two rates to calculate the current spot rate and then the expected spot rate in one month, and then we can figure out that uh, rate of return. So let me pull in the math here and we'll walk through that. Okay, so USD JPY spot, we're going to be taking the USD Euro rate, which is 1.30805, and we're going to multiply that by 1 over the JPY Euro rate. So whenever we're adding or multiplying together different exchange rates to um, get, our, get to our actual exchange rate that we want, we need... In this case, we have USD as the price currency and JPY as the base currency. So whatever you're multiplying together, you need to get those into the right spots. So we've got USD in the right spot. It's in the price currency for Euro. We need to flip JPY and Euro to get JPY into the base currency spot. So to do that, we're going to do one over the current spot rate. So this is going to make this spot right here um, Euro JPY. So then we can simply just multiply those together. We get 194.4366. And then we're going to do the same thing for the expected spot rates. Uh, so we'll take that number, multiply, um, and then we're going to do 1 over 0 0.0089. So we get 154 for expected spot rate in one month. So the expected change then is going to be our ending value minus beginning value divided by ending value, simple um, return formula, gives us minus 0.2049, which corresponds with A, negative 20.49%. Okay, we're looking at question 26 now. Which of the following must most likely happen for the balance of trade to improve? Savings must increase, domestic production must decrease, or uh, investments must be greater than savings. So let's pull in our formula here. So we'll start with... Um, Essentially, savings is going to equal investment plus um, government spending minus tax revenue plus um, our balance of trade here. So this is the main variable we're looking at. So exports minus imports, that's balance of trade. So what we do here is we're going to move um, everything else over to this side of the formula so we can focus on balance of trade. So we've got balance of trade here. So saving is a positive, investment's a negative, and then uh, spent, government spending minus taxes is, is also a negative. So let's look at how these um, have an effect. So A, savings must increase. So if on the right side of this equation, if savings go up, that is a positive variable. So that's also going to lead to uh, the balance of trade improving. So that can, uh, sounds like it'll be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out B and C. Domestic production must decrease. So domestic production is going to be X. Um, so we can pretty clearly see here if X decreases, um, that's going to make our balance of trade worse because then we're also probably going to have to import more. Um, so it's going to make this variable on the left worse, which is what we're looking at. So we'll cross that off. And then investments must be greater than savings. We can see here that I is a negative uh, value. So if investment increases, that's going to um, make the left side of the equation go down. So we can cross off C as well, and we'll stick with A, savings must increase. Question 27. A perfectly competitive firm should shut down immediately if it is operating such that A, selling price is less than the marginal cost. So in this scenario, we don't necessarily need to shut down 
um, we just may need to sell less units um, for a lower marginal cost. So as we're increasing our units, our marginal cost will go up. And so we may just need to be selling less units. We don't necessarily need to um, shut down. B, selling price is less than average variable cost. This is going to be our answer. Um, variable costs are directly um, related to the units sold. So if we're making, if we're losing, if we're, let's say our average variable cost is five and we're selling our widget for four, there's no point in continuing to produce more widgets if we're just gonna keep making a minus one uh, profit. Um, so this would be a scenario where we wanna shut down right away. C, selling price is less than average total cost, but greater than average variable costs. So this is, diff this is difficult um, because in both of these cases, we're technically are um, not making a profit. Um, but the difference here is we're making enough to cover the average variable cost, but our average total cost, the other component to that is fixed costs, which at this point are going to be considered sunk costs. So we already bought our machine to create a widget. Um, but now the, but now technically the cost of the widget that we have to buy it for from all our supplies plus the cost of the equipment is um, not making us a profit on that widget. However, we can make a profit, we can make, <laughs> we can sell the widget for more than its cost uh, to us from a supply standpoint, but the equipment is still getting us on the average total cost. So essentially, if we keep producing, we can at least cover variable costs and then start to offset some of the loss that we're making on the fixed costs. So it basically leads us to have a lower overall um, loss than we would in answer B. So long-winded way of uh, going with B. Question 28, which of the following is least likely in objective fiscal policy? So two of these are gonna be um, objectives of fiscal policy and one will not be. A, liquidity trap. Um, this sounds like it's gonna be our answer. This is not something really related to fiscal policy. It's more so related to monetary policy. And it's certainly not going to be an objective to fall into a liquidity trap. Um, and so this happens related to monetary policy, basically when, uh, when uh, rates are um, low and savings rates are really high, which kind of leads to any changes in um, monetary policy to be ineffective. Uh, B, controlling inflation. This is certainly going to be a fiscal policy. They can put measures in place to kind of tamp down demand, like increasing taxes, um, which can have an effect on inflation. And then C, increasing industrial or agricultural output. Um, that uh, certainly could be an objective of fiscal policy to kind of help the economy um, grow. So we'll go with A, liquidity trap. Question 29. Which of the following is least likely a strategy used by governments to protect domestic goods? So two of these answers will be used to protect domestic goods and one will not. A, licenses, B, import quotas, or C, a decrease in tariff. So licenses is gonna be, um, a license is used to, is a permit basically that a foreign government, or not foreign government, a foreign company would need to get in order to export um, goods to this domestic uh, country. Um, so basically the license can kind of control where and how, where and how many goods are kind of coming from outside countries. So this would be a, um, a strategy used. So since it's a strategy we would use, we will cross it off since we're looking for one that would not be used. B, import quotas. Similar to licenses, import quotas are going to put a, um, a number or amount on domestic goods that can come in, not domestic goods, on goods that can come in um, from outside the country and it may be um, specified on certain goods or services or it could be kind of across the board uh, imports. So we can probably cross that off as well. C, a decrease in tariffs. This is going to be our correct answer. Decrease in tariffs is going to make um, exporting to this country a lot easier for other countries because it's going to lower the cost. And so a decrease in tariffs is going to have um, is going to have the opposite effect of protecting domestic goods. It's going to encourage more um, foreign companies to kind of 
produce and send their goods to uh, the domestic country. Answer C. Question 30. The stock index's arithmetic mean return is 6% with a standard deviation of 11.7%. The coefficient of variation is closest to. So this is pretty straightforward. It's really just kind of committing this uh, formula to memory. Coefficient of variation is going to equal standard deviation divided by the mean. So we get 11.7 divided by 6 um, gives us 1.95. Corresponds right there to answer B.